Howdy. Howdy. Folks, for those of you who haven't met, my name is Mark Welsh, and I am privileged to be the Dean of the Bush School of Government and Public Service. And we're here tonight uh, really to kind of take a look at the headlines a little bit and talk about what's going on around the world and uh, how economic policies and the global markets are driving change and driving activity and driving a little bit of pain and a little bit of, of uh, celebration around our world. One of the great things about working here at the Bush Center is that uh, I have two wonderful partners, and, uh, and I know at least one of them is here tonight. Uh, Mr. Warren Finch, who's the director of the, the Presidential Library here, sitting over here along with his wife, Mary. Uh, David Jones, are you here tonight? David was going to try and get by, but I hadn't seen him yet. David is the director of the, uh, the George Bush Library Foundation. And it's kind of a partnership that works very closely with Texas A&M University uh, to try and make sure that we can bring events like this to the university so that everyone in the community, in, in our college, and in the university benefits from it. And that's what tonight's all about. You know, one of the great things about the Mossbager Institute, it has a mission statement that includes a couple of words I want to read to you. I won't go through the long version, I promise. But the, the work that the Mossbacher Institute for Trade, Economics, and Public Policy does is to help decision makers meet the challenges posed by a new world order of global markets and increasingly diffuse political and economic power. And tonight is all about discussing those challenges. And we have some special guests joining us tonight. Uh, as we do that, first I'd like to introduce the president of Texas A&M University, Michael Young, sitting in the middle of the front row. Thank you for being here, sir. I will just mention that President Young also holds an appointment on the Bush School faculty, so just thought I'd mention that. Uh, next, sitting next to him is uh, Mrs. Gina Flores, the wife of Congressman Bill Flores. Ma'am, thank you so much for taking your time to be here. And if we're in a school of government service, it's also appropriate to note the service that Mrs. Flores and her family are, are extending to our nation as she supports her husband in this effort. So ma'am, thank you, and uh, we feel for you sometimes, and we celebrate with you at others. Uh, I'd also like to introduce uh, in the front row Mr. Tyson Volko, who's the, uh, the, the, the president and CEO of the Texas A&M Foundation and drives so much activity that supports all of us here at Texas A&M. Tyson, thank you for being here. <laughs> Two very special people I'd like to stand up briefly because they did all the work to make this possible. Uh, Jennifer Moore and Cindy Gauss. I see Jennifer right here, and Cindy, where are you hiding? Because you're always hiding somewhere. There you are. Thank you, ladies. And there is nobody better qualified to introduce our, uh, our speaker tonight and also our guest tonight, uh, and also to join him on the stage than Dr. Lori Taylor. Dr. Lori Taylor is the director of the Mossbacher Institute. Uh, she has been doing this for a couple of years, but she spent 14 years beginning her career before she came into the academic arena working for the Federal Reserve Bank in Dallas uh, in the research division. And she is a remarkable economist, she's a remarkable professor and educator, and she's a remarkable human being. Uh, the format tonight is going to be Dr. Taylor with our special guest on stage, a uh, moderated question and answer discussion. Uh, your questions will be taken on the cards that the, the ambassadors, ambassadors have passed out to you. Please pass them to the aisle and we'll get them up here to Dr. Taylor. And why don't I shut up now, get Lori Taylor up here to talk to you. Uh, Lori comes to us with a bachelor's degree in economics, another bachelor's degree in uh, business administration. She has a master's and a PhD in economics, uh, and she is now in charge. Lori, over to you. Howdy, and thank you all for coming out this evening. I really do appreciate that. I've collected the questions that you all gave us out in the lobby on the cards, and I've got more than enough to keep us busy for the next hour, and I'm looking forward to it very much. Our guest this evening is Robert S. Kaplan, who has served as president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas since September 8th of 2015. As president of the Dallas Fed, Mr. Kaplan serves on the Federal Open Market Committee and is a key player in the formulation of U.S. monetary policy. Immediately prior to joining the Fed, Mr. Kaplan served as the Martin Marshall Professor of Management Practice and a Senior Associate Dean at the Harvard Business School. And before that, Mr. Kaplan was Vice Chairman of Goldman Sachs with global responsibility for the firm's investment banking and investment management decisions. During his 23-year career at Goldman Sachs, Mr. Kaplan served in a variety of capacities including as head of the Corporate Finance Department and head of Asia Pacific Investment Banking. Mr. Kaplan also has his philanthropic side. He serves on numerous charitable boards and organizations, 
including his current role as co-chairman of the Draper Richards Kaplan Foundation, a global venture philanthropy firm that invests in developing nonprofit enterprises dedicated to addressing social issues. Mr. Kaplan was born and raised in Prairie Village, Kansas, and is a fellow graduate of the University of Kansas. I am sure he joins me in mourning our thoroughly busted brackets. <laughs> Please help me cheer him up, and cheer me up too, with a rousing welcome to the stage. stage up here. Uh, we, we make a practice of making sure that the Jayhawk is in the room at the time. <coughs> All right, good. Laura Gay Big is also a Jayhawk, so the Bush School is, is we're, we're infiltrating rapidly. Okay. All righty. So uh, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to your comments, and I'll fess up that I got some crib notes from the Fed. Okay. So Sorry. some of these questions won't be a terribly huge <laughs> surprise. I'll try and, and filter in a few from the audience and a few of my own. Okay. But the easy softball kickoff is, what's your assessment of the U.S. economy? <laughs> All right. Uh, so, and, and thank you for having me here. Thank you, Dean Welsh. Thank you for everyone that I've met here today, the president of the university, everyone. It's been... It's been uh, it's been great to be here today, and uh, it's a great center, and congratulations on all you're doing. So with that, let me make a few comments uh, about uh, the U.S. economy. So uh, I'll get right to the punchline. Um, the headline uh, facts are, uh, it's my own view and the view of uh, economists at Dallas Fed, the GDP growth this year will be at about two and a quarter percent. It was around a little under two percent last year, a little more than two percent this year. Um, and uh, that is sluggish growth by historical standards in the United States, but we've now been through six or seven or eight years where that's been the type of growth, and I'll, we'll talk about a little bit more why that is. Mm -hmm. uh, but even though it's relatively sluggish by historical standards, my own view is it'll be enough to continue to take slack out of the labor market, um, ultimately drive down the unemployment rate, and it will be sufficient to cause the uh, inflation rate, which is the second Fed target, to start continuing to move uh, toward 2%. So um, there are some structural reasons and other reasons why growth is not higher. Well, let's talk about in a minute what those are. But I think uh, it's solid growth. And the key underpinning of that growth is a stronger U.S. consumer. Uh, and so that's one comment I'll make. We've spent the last eight years in the United States <coughs> with the household sector deleveraging. In 2007, 2008, the household sector in this country was historically highly leveraged. And the reason we didn't notice it that much is if you took a debt to income, you were extremely high. If you took debt to asset values, looked reasonable. As we all know, when home prices collapsed and asset values dropped, uh, it became clear that households were very highly leveraged based on their income and the employment market worsened. And so we've spent the last seven or eight years with the household sector slowly deleveraging. They've done it by reducing debt a bit and, we've done, and they've done it by increasing incomes. And we're finally in a position after seven or eight years where the consumer, which is 70% of the economy, is, in, is, is healthier and has got capacity to spend. Doesn't mean they will spend, and they are under safe for retirement, and they have other issues, but the household sector is stronger, which is why, for me, it's the key underpinning why I think we'll have solid growth this next year uh, because of the strength of the household sector. Okay. So what do you see as the upside risks to that forecast, and what do you see as the downside risks to that forecast? So I'll start first with the upside. Uh, we know business optimism is high. We know there's been our, uh, so number one, and so business spending looks to be a bit stronger. Uh, businesses are more positive about adding capacity, adding workers. Uh, that optimism, uh, you know, may not sustain, but we see that optimism. In addition, you've had some rally in the markets. There's some positive wealth effects 
those are positive. And then the last thing is <coughs> you have the prospect of some structural reforms like a, a regulatory review, uh, which could be helpful. Mm -hmm. Potentially infrastructure spending if it's thoughtfully done. Potentially corporate tax reform if it's thoughtfully done. That could all provide some upside to the forecast. The negative or the, the flip side is GDP in this country is, uh, is the sum of growth in the labor force, growth in productivity. The, the, the dilemma in this country is the workforce is aging. The participation rate was 66% in 2007. It's 63% today. At the Dallas Fed, we think the bulk of that decline is demographic. It's, age, it's aging of the workforce. The problem is we think that trend will continue and will be below 61% in the next 10 years. The problem, back to what's the downside, every, every policy I'll be looking at this year will be asking, does it help grow the workforce or does it improve productivity? I mentioned regulatory review, infrastructure spending, corporate tax reform might actually be helpful, particularly with improving productivity. Uh, if there are policies relating to immigration, the Affordable Care Act, or trade, which, may, which actually could undermine workforce growth and productivity, those could actually be negative for GDP. And the jury's out as to which items are gonna get enacted, what's actually gonna happen, um, uh, and so that's the reason for the balancing. Okay, great. So what's your outlook for the energy industry? Texas would care about that <coughs> a lot. Yes, so the energy industry, um, and, and the good news, we have Mene Ugel, who's here today, who is co-head of our research department and senior energy economist. Mm -hmm. And as uh, Lori knows, we have uh, lots of energy expertise at the Dallas Fed. Our own view is gl global supply and demand in, the, in, in oil, in the energy business, is such that we think we're moving toward balance sometime by the, we hope by the middle of 2017. What do I mean by that? Uh, not about plus or minus 96 million barrels a day of production in the world, and approximately to get to balance, you need 96 million barrels of consumption. We have been oversupplied in the world in 2014, 15, and 16. Uh, in response to that oversupply, prices have come down. Uh, and also in response, U.S. supply has declined. In the United States, we were as high as 9.5 million barrels a day production. We declined as low at about 8.5, 8.6 million barrels a day in the middle, in the fall of 2016. The problem was, why the U.S. was cutting, the rest of the world was actually increasing, which more than offset those supply reductions here. <clears throat> but the reason we think we're moving toward balance is not that supply is declining globally. It's not. It's growing just more slowly. And daily demand, we think, is growing about 1.3 million barrels a day. So what's happening is you have slowing supply growth, demand catching up. And that's why we think we're heading toward balance. The OPEC agreement that was made at the end of last year, if implemented, would cut about a million barrels a day. That's helpful to global supply demand balance. But, uh, and so this is why we think you've seen firming prices. The reason you've seen the recent volatility is U.S. production now starting to increase, and there's a question whether OPEC will stick to its supply reduction agreement. And it's not easy for them to stick to that agreement when they see U.S. production is actually going up. And so it's kind of a fragile equilibrium here. Uh, having said that, we mm -hmm. still think that in prices in the high 40s, around where we are now, uh, you can still, you can drill in the Permian and other places and be profitable. And this is why we're seeing rig count in the United States continue to inch up. So, um, the long and the short of it is, in the near term, I think you're going to see a lot of nail biting about mm -hmm. will OPEC stick to its agreement? How fast is U.S. production increasing? Does it scuttle this fragile equilibrium? Uh, and can we start get to balance and start working off excess inventory? I think if you project out ahead of three to five years, <coughs> I'm pretty confident that supply demand is going to keep growing. 
uh, and you're going to probably actually could even be in an undersupply situation five years from now. In the interim, though, we're sort of working our way around some type of balance equilibrium, and I think it's somewhat fragile. So you're going to see more price volatility, uh, but, but over the medium term, we would expect to see ultimately prices continue to firm, if not go up, at least firm. Okay. Well, I, I used to tell the tale that as energy goes, go, there goes Texas. Uh, I'm getting the idea that that's not completely true anymore, but what is your outlook for Texas? So, uh, d just on Lori's point, um, if you go back to 2014, the energy business as a percentage of GDP in Texas was 13%. It got as low as 6 7% last year. Uh, and now gradually inching its way up. That's a, that's a dramatic decline from 13 to six or seven. Part of that was the weakness in the energy business and part of it was Texas is growing, getting more diversified, and it's a dramatically different economy than say the oil bust of the 80s. So we are much more diversified. Uh, we've got major cities growing rapidly and we've been a magnet for people and firms. So while I worry about aging demographics in the United States and slowing population growth, Texas is on the winning end of this battle and that we're, we've, been, we've been drawing people who are coming here. Firms are coming here. Uh, population in Texas 10 years ago was approximately uh, 22 and a half million people. We're now moving our way up toward 28 million people. So we're growing. States like Illinois are flat to declining. And so that provides a, a, a tailwind for Texas mm -hmm. GDP growth. So the long, long and short of it, it's, it, I'm very optimistic about the future of Texas. Um, these, these migration and diversification trends are very positive. And now we're to the point where the energy business may not be a tailwind, but at least it's not a headwind. It's at least neutral and probably becoming mm -hmm. a tailwind. So we expect job growth in Texas in 2017. Our Dallas Fed official estimate is in excess of two and a quarter percent. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's the highest rate of job growth we've had in three years. And I'm, I'm very optimistic given these dynamics, even if we have volatility in energy. I think the future of Texas is very, very bright. And I think this migration trend is alive and well and continuing and will continue for years to come. So we're gonna keep growing population here. The Fed, and you yourself seem pretty optimistic about future economic conditions, the evidence in just the recent decision to raise interest <coughs> rates. On the other hand, former Chairman Bernanke during 2004 to 2007 also was optimistic and didn't see the 2008 crisis coming. What's changed since that time in terms of the Fed's forecasting accuracy? <laughs> so. Um well, you know, the, fir the first thing an economist will tell you is how poor the track record of, of forecasting is for economists. We okay? make weather forecasters I will good. say, though, this, it makes the economists here feel better. I was a business person. I can tell you the forecasting ability of the economy by business people is probably, and I'll give, put myself in, is even worse. So it's not that easy to forecast the economy. But let me tell you, uh, uh, let me focus on some of the big, the mm -hmm. big structural changes and big secular structural forces. Um, the, the, the bad news leading up to the crisis in 2008 was just what I said, how highly leveraged the household sector was. We, we drove a lot of our growth by increasing debt to GDP at the household sector. Secondly, uh, the financial sector was very highly leveraged and because we didn't have some of the regulation, uh, while the regulation that's happened in the last eight years hasn't always been popular, I can tell you having someone who worked at a big bank and was on the board of another big bank, we have, uh, if we had some of the uh, regulation today back then, we would have caught the problems earlier. The financial sector was dramatically over leveraged, particularly the big banks. <coughs> there was debt to GD, the banks didn't have enough capital, and there was all these securitizations, and then there were all these counterparty transactions, derivatives that allowed people to buy insurance on these mm -hmm. transactions. The estimate is there were 90 trillion, 90 trillion of notional value of credit default swaps. That is, people were buying insurance on debt. The problem is there was only 10 trillion of debt on the planet 
and there was 90 trillion of insurance contracts. So this had become a casino. This was no longer about risk reduction. This was about gambling. So what happened is, uh, when the crisis happened, we were dramatically over leveraged, and it took us a number of years to deleverage the financial sector and deleverage the household sector. Uh, and I think part of the slow growth in the last eight years was this household sector deleveraging because it's so important in the economy. Okay, what's the problem today, though? Problem of while we were making great progress in the last eight years, we got some new issues today. Number one, aging demographics. That these demographic trends I talked about, aging population, is even more of an issue today than it was 10 years ago. And that's going to be a headwind going forward on economic growth. Number one. Number two, uh, the world is much more globally integrated. China is dramatically bigger today than it was 10 years ago. And the problem is China has dramatic overcapacity. They have doubled their debt to GDP in order to fuel that growth. Uh, and the long and the short of it is they're now trying to manage that situation and they've got a multi-year transition going on from being an export-driven economy to being a consumer-driven economy. That will take 20 years for the, to, to execute that. And so they want to move 400 million people from either rural areas into cities or move, make those rural areas into cities. And there's no textbook for that. And so they want to do a 20 million a year. It's going to take a long time. Why does that matter to us? China, because it's now so big, they're over capacity and financial volatility is rippling back into the United States. It's one of the reasons why I would argue um, inflation has been much more muted, but it also means that the world is gonna have to get used to, from here, lower levels of GDP growth from China. China's been growing at 6.5% a year. That, I don't believe, is sustainable. You're gonna see that number drift down, and that will create some challenges for global growth. The other two big drivers that are different We've always had, we've had the early stages of technology-enabled disruption mm -hmm. 10 years ago. Amazon versus retail stores. Uh, you can, the iPhone versus, uh, you know, cameras and phone. You know, you forget these things. But it's happening in every industry. We are now in, in a period of dramatic and accelerating what I call technology-enabled disruption, where technology is replacing workers rapidly. Amazon versus retail is a great example of that, mm -hmm. where it is destroying jobs, and those people have to be, you know, adapt and go into new industries. That's one challenge. The second challenge is because of technology-enabled disruption, businesses have less pricing power than any time in my life. In other words, unless you offer a very distinctive product, you can't increase prices because consumers have an easy ability with technology to shop your goods very rapidly, and they'll bust by somewhere else. So that's a dramatic change, and we haven't adjusted to it yet. And some of that is being confused with globalization. In other words, if you're losing jobs in your town, you think it must be globalization. Maybe it's immigration. And more likely today, it's technology-enabled disruption that is causing the loss of those jobs. How should we adapt to it? We've got to adapt by creating much more of what's called middle skills training. Uh, some used to call it vocational training. We've got to help people when they lose their jobs get retrained or trained and retrained and back into the workforce. And we've been slow in this country to do that. And I think you're seeing it in labor market slack. It's why there are people more and more on the sideline. They need to get retrained. And those people tend to have, if you have a high school or less than high school mm -hmm. uh, degree today, you're gonna have a tougher time getting back into the workforce. If you've been to college, it's a different matter. And we've got to adjust to that. And then the last big issue, I would call it the end of the debt super cycle. I mentioned household sectors deleverage, financial sectors deleverage, great. Business is a little more leveraged, I think it's manageable. Government is much more leveraged than it was 10 years ago though. Uh, government debt held by the public is 77% of GDP. The present value of unfunded entitlements, $46 trillion. Not sustainable. Reason we don't notice it that much, rates are so low. I think that's gonna create a headwind for GDP growth. So demographics, globalization, technology-enabled disruption, and this high level of debt, these are the new challenges we're facing. And I think it's 
it's creating uh, headwinds for GDP growth. Mm -hmm. um, and we're going to have to learn to adapt to these issues uh, if we're going to grow faster than we are now. So That's a mouthful. It was a mouthful. And one, one of the, the members of the audience is, is worried that with rates rising, interest payments on that debt that you just described are going to start taking all the fun out of being a public servant. Yeah, and th they're right to worry about it. If you have 19 trillion, let's say, for example, purposes mm -hmm. of public debt, and 100 basis points would be $190 billion a year. <coughs> That's a very significant number. <coughs> so, uh, from the monetary policy, from the Fed point of view, uh, we've said, and I've said, um, we should be moving very gradually and patiently. Uh, for me, because a lot of these structural issues, I think we would be wise to move gradually and patiently, even as we achieve our dual mandates of full employment and inflation. But I think it also means, in terms of government policy more broadly, that we're going to have to find ways to reduce debt to GDP at the government level and be very careful if there is new policy that it doesn't further increase debt to GDP. And so I think this is one of the big challenges we have right now that we need to be facing mm -hmm. as a country. You have any ideas on how we could get that done? Yeah. Uh, so that some of them, these are controversial and as a central banker I've learned, as you know, Mm -hmm. to be careful not to wade. In my previous life, I was very liberal in, in, uh, in terms of wading and not liberal, politically liberal to wade into these issues. As a mm -hmm. central banker, you'll notice we're very careful to try to be apolitical. But I would say, what are things that you'd look at? Um, I think things, again, that grow the labor force and grow productivity are going to help us deleverage because we'll grow faster. And nominal GDP is what services debt. That's number one. Number two, I do think entitlement reform, is, as sensitive as it is, has got to be on the table uh, because I don't think this $46 trillion is sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, those are two things that I'm, I, I believe we're going to have to look at. And this is why the regulatory review that I talked about earlier, if we can streamline, we still need some regulation, but if it can be thoughtfully done, we can streamline regulation. If that would help us grow faster, that's going to help us deleverage. So I think we've got to, the war of 2008 was how to deleverage. The war of 2017 is we've got to grow mm -hmm. and we've got to be very thoughtful about how we, uh, about, about things that might increase debt to GDP further. Uh, when you spoke earlier to the commercial banking program students, uh, they believe that one of the big takeaways was to start watching the market daily and inform themselves through sources such as the Wall Street Journal. So uh, I think they, 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 they want a little more guidance. What do you suggest as a next step once okay. they've familiarized themselves with these concepts and are out working in the business sector? All right. So this is now put my professor hat on and, uh, and maybe father hat too, but, mm -hmm. uh, but professor hat. So one thing I always ask is, you know, do you watch the market? You want to be in business? You've got to read the paper every day. And you know, if you're a business person, I'd always like to compete with somebody who's not reading the paper every day, if you, if, who's less well-informed than me. Uh, and that means, I've mentioned Google Finance, look at the markets every day and you see this throughout, see what's going on. And while that's not an end in and of itself, it's the thing I'm very interested about. I can't necessarily predict the future. I can't tell individual students where exactly I ought to go, but I can tell them if they get into good habits. Uh, they're going to ultimately have to figure out their strengths, their weaknesses, their passions, and find a career that matches with their strengths, weaknesses, and passions. But they also need to get into good habits of being informed and being up to speed because they're going to do better. But probably, so what would the next step be? Next step is do that and understand, write down on a piece of paper your strengths and your weaknesses. Talk to people who observe you and ask them what your strengths and weaknesses are. And then second, what do you love to do? Now, for most students, including me when I was at I don't know. And even sometimes, I'm not sure myself today. But think about, what do you, what, when are you at your best? Where do you sh when do you shine? When in your life have you shined? You did great. You loved it. You were happy. You felt like you were really doing well. 
What, what do you learn from that experience? What were you doing? What was the subject? What was the environment? Try to figure out what you love, where you're happy, where you have a, what you have a passion for. And I think that's a big challenge for all of us, not just students, but it's a big challenge for students as they get started. Mm -hmm. If they can do that, I think they'll be more likely to get in the right neighborhood. Okay. So you're a strong advocate for reading the newspaper and keeping informed. Is there such a thing as fake news in the business literature? Well, I'll tell you, we were talking about this one. There's such thing as noise. Okay. And uh, I would say, um, as a business person, and certainly as a person involved in the markets, you're always sensitive to noise. There's more noise today. And what do I mean by noise? Information, 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 incoming, 300 channels. When I grew up, there were, what were there, three networks, three. maybe public television, if, if you could get the connection right. You know, UHF, yeah. remember that? And, and the, these young people don't know, remember that, right? But, but today, you've got enormous information. Uh, and a lot of it is, when I call it noise, it may not be accurate information. It might be repeating upon repeating, something incorrect or misleading that gets repeated 30 times and gets back to you like it's a fact. And so the challenge today for all of us and students is to screen out the noise and try to focus in on what are the two or three most important things and get good information. But if you're not, this is why I said to people this morning, if you're not yourself well informed and you're not looking at details every day and, and sort of getting beneath the surface of the headlines, you're going to be very susceptible to get buffeted around. And uh, you know, you have a very different view of the world about what reality is if you just read the headlines or hear a news flash than if you're d going deeper every day and trying to dig in and understand what's going on. And I think it's, so it was important for me in my, when I started my career to read the paper every day, I'd say I multiply by 50 now, because there's mm -hmm. so much more distractions and noise than there was, than there, there was when I was growing, when, you, mm -hmm. when we were younger. And I think it, the premium on doing your homework is higher. Okay. So are there, what in particular do you do to cut through the noise? Are there any specific indicators that you follow more closely than others or any sources <coughs> you follow more closely than others? Yes, so listen, what, when, when, what I, one thing I've done consistently in my business career, if I was running a business or if I was studying a market, is what you learn to do is, is I always ask yourself, what are the two or three, it's like when you're driving a car. There's all these, there's a lot of information, there's all these dials. You know, what's like when I look in an airplane cockpit, it scares me because I just see all this stuff and I don't understand any of it. But if you're a pilot, you know I need to look at these things, right? And I can fly the plane or I can drive a car. Same thing goes true, whatever you're trying to do, figure out what the two or three, and you may have to ask people for their opinion on this, but I do this a lot. What are the, and when I came to the Fed, I did, what are the two or three most important drivers of blank? You know, GDP, I mentioned, workforce growth, productivity. If I, if I watch television, they probably throw out another 50 things that, right? But I learned those are the two things, so I watch those like a hawk and anything that affects those. Having a framework where you ask yourself, what are the two or three most important things that drive, make, be, what makes a good salesperson? What makes a good central banker? What makes a good professor? You know, what are the two or three things I've got to do really well? The rest of it, you don't, you know, you can focus on, but those what, don't, they don't need to be priorities. You have to figure out what are your two or three most important priorities? What do I need to be great at or understand? And it's different for every subject, but I always suggest to people, try to figure out what those two or three or four things are. And that will help you screen out the noise. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I always kid around, an architect looks at a building, well, I look at a building, I should say, and I just see, I don't know what I'm seeing. Architect knows the two or three things they're looking for, and they can understand it, but to, you gotta apply that to everything you do, I think, if you're a, if you're a business person, and uh, as, you're, as you're running, doing whatever it is you do. Okay, so what are the two or three things you look for for inflation? So that one, interesting. Um, what we tend, I've sort of gravitated to, and you, you're familiar with this, mm -hmm. um, there, I, I tend to look at, we, we call it core inflation in Dallas, 
We have our own measure, naturally. Uh, the trim Dallas mean. trim mean, right. And so what that does is say, let's trim out the most extreme moves every month up and down. So let's say energy is very weak, we screen it out. Let's say food is very strong, we screen that out. And let's focus on core. Why? Because in any given month, you got lots of variables, things going like this. You could get all over the place. But core turns out, core inflation is very stable. It was, and what's an example? In 2014, core, our Dallas trim mean, run about 1.5%. 2016, uh, run, or excuse me, 2015, maybe around 1.6, 1.7. Uh, it's now ticked up, that's about 1.9%. So despite headline inflation going like this, core inflation has actually been very stable, the Dallas trim mean. And so we've developed that as a measure, as a way to screen out a lot of the noise and I still think that's a pretty good indicator and it gives me confidence, not certainty, but confidence, we're probably moving toward 2% inflation eventually. And that's the goal? That's the Fed's stated goal. So the Fed has two goals, full employment and price stability. The way we define price stability, we have said 2% is our target. We don't want to run persistently below 2% or persistently above. So yes, that's our goal. Uh, we've been running persistently below for the last, what, seven or eight years? Mm -hmm. And we're just now finally inching our way up to 2%, but that is our goal. That's when we think, we will think we will have created, uh, we, have, we will have achieved that price stability goal, which is one of the reasons why the fact that I think we are making progress as well as toward full employment, that we're talking about removing accommodation, which is a, a fancy way of saying we're talking about slowly, gradually increasing the Fed funds rate. So why isn't the goal zero? Uh, the, the Fed made a decision, as you know, many years ago, lots of debate. It could have been 3%, it could have been 1%. I think it was, our, it was the view and it preceded me that, I should ask you that question, <laughs> by the way, why don't you tell me, uh, that 2% was probably a reasonable level mm -hmm. at which if it ran there consistently, uh, it would not, was not unduly inflationary, that it would uh, create price instability, and it also you always worry about deflation. It's far enough the zero bound, and we always fear deflation. It's high enough that we had confidence we're not gonna lapse into deflation. Why do you think we picked 2%, by the way? I, I think that uh, it had a lot to do with a, a fear of deflation, and, not, and you never hit a target smack dab on. You're right. always going to be sometimes a little bit above and sometimes a little bit below. And there were, I think there was a deep concern about a little bit below zero. And by the way, for people who, who, who um, just expand on this, the reason there's such a fear of deflation is people think back of the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. And we talked about deleveraging in this country. It's hard to deleverage. If you have deflation, it's extremely hard to deleverage. Um, and so I think there was a fear how to destabilizing deflation would be to the U.S. economy. And, and a lot of people look to Japan and were very nervous. Yeah. So. so the Fed raised interest rates at the March meeting, which made this extremely salient conversation, so thank you very much. <laughs> um, but what, does that, what drove that increase, in, and how should we think about the prospects for future increases? Okay. So the framework that we use, or I'll speak for myself, that I use for, uh, um, for um, monetary policy we have, so we have a dual mandate, as I mentioned. We're trying to achieve two things, full employment and price stability. <coughs> On full employment, you can't just look at the headline rate because there's other elements of slack beyond just the 4.7% unemployment rate. So I look at discouraged workers, I look at something called U6, which is discouraged workers plus people working part-time for economic reasons who would like to work full-time, plus the unemployment rate, that's 9.2%. The pre-recession low was 8.1%, so I look at progress though on that. Uh, and everything I see tells me we're making progress. We're not at full employment in my view. I think there's still some room to remove slack, but we're moving our way toward full employment. And we just talked about the price goal. So my, the framework is you remain accommodative um, until you see evidence that you're starting to meet your dual 
mandate objectives. And when you see, if you get enough confidence, which I have, that we're meeting our dual mandate, you start removing accommodation. But my own view is you do it gradually and patiently. History has shown when the Fed has removed accommodation patiently, the economy can manage it. If, on the other hand, we wait too long to where we, we're afraid that inflation is running away from us, we might have to raise more quickly. And that historically has tended to be, make it more likely you have a recession. So what I'd like to see us do is gradually and patiently remove accommodation. So for me, mm -hmm. it was important to move in March. So we're still accommodative. We're at 75 to 100 basis points. And different Fed presidents have different views, but we've sort of said the neutral rate, the rate at which we're neither accommodative or restrictive, is maybe in the neighborhood of two and three quarters, plus or minus. That's a, that's a moving target. So we need to keep moving toward neutral. Mm -hmm. But at 75 to 100, we're still accommodative. I think it's appropriate. It's like taking your foot off the accelerator. We haven't put our foot on the brake, just taking our foot a little bit off the accelerator. Uh, and I think that uh, that approach, as long as I see us continuing to make progress toward full employment and meet our inflation goal, if we continue to make progress, I will be continuing to be supportive of taking additional steps to remove further amounts of accommodation, i.e. increase the Fed funds rate. Okay. So could you to run uh, those of us who aren't totally familiar through the process by which the Fed makes a decision like it's time to <coughs> take another one of those baby steps? So the Fed is a very deliberative organization. There are 17 participants around the Federal Open Market Committee table. Okay? Uh, you're supposed to have, we have 12 bank presidents, and, and when we're fully staffed, we have seven governors. Right now we have five, two of the seats are open in that they just never got confirmed. And so we have 17 people around the table. We're fully staffed, we'll have 19. Um, in any given year, five of those 12 bank presidents vote, and all of the governors vote. So right now there are 10 votes. Um, I'm a voter this year, mm -hmm. and four other fellow bank presidents vote, and then five of the governors vote. What we do, we meet eight times a year, formal meeting. Uh, we just had one in March. Well, our next one will be May. <coughs> what we do is we, uh, as, you can, as you can tell, we have 1,300 people at Dallas Fed. We have uh, uh, basically 30 economists. So I spend an enormous amount of time talking with our economists, doing our research, doing our work, and I spend an enormous amount of time talking to business leaders all through the district, as well as in the country, trying to assess economic conditions. Every other Fed president's doing the same thing. So as I approach a meeting, we start preparing. Uh, we're preparing all the time and thinking about what's going on, but we intensively prepare two weeks before the meeting. Okay, then arrive at Wa in Washington on Monday, uh, and usually we'll have committee meetings on Monday. The Federal Open Market Committee then will convene on Tuesday. We all have assigned seats. I sit at one of the seats at the head of the table. I didn't choose it, and no one remembers why the Dallas Fed head sits in that seat. But my predecessor told me that when he asked, nobody then, years ago, remembered why the Dallas Fed head sat in that seat. It's been decades that the head of the Dallas Fed sits in a certain seat. Um, we spend Tuesday, each of us speaks for about 10 minutes around the table and explains what economic conditions are in our district, our views about conditions in the country and the world. And I listen to every other president and governor do the same thing. Janet Yellen goes last. We often will hear a special topic or presentation from our staff. Mm -hmm. Day two, Wednesday, we reconvene again. We usually have dinner together that night. We'll reconvene on Wednesday. And on Wednesday, we only talk about, given what we talked about Tuesday, what are our recommendations for monetary policy? Okay? Each of us talks for about 10 minutes on Wednesday. Janet Yellen goes last. Um, and then at the end of that meeting, in the last 33 seconds or so, we vote. All right? Either you want to keep rates where they are, or you want to increase rates, or you want to decrease rates. We make a decision at the end of that meeting, and that decision then gets communicated two hours later. 
through a public statement that we've agonized over the wording over, uh, and then on every qu on quarterly we'll have a press conference. There is no review body, there's no legislature, we make a decision, it is, in a, it is executed, and literally the market's desk of the Fed, primarily at headquartered in New York, will work to execute that decision, which is what happened two weeks ago, and meeting adjourned. That's how we make monetary policy decisions. Highly so, deliberative, highly. High de highly deliberative, big old vote at the very end of the meeting. Is there, do you perceive much pressure to be unanimous in that vote? <coughs> I don't. I would say debate and disagreement, although done in a constructive collegial way, is for me the hallmark of that meeting, meaning People come in independently, and I come in independently prepared to uh, express my views. I also listen uh, carefully, because I'll learn a lot in that meeting, and I hope from my comments other people learn from me. And uh, the one job, so what's the job of the chairperson of the Fed? One is she has to have, have her own economic views, but the other job she has is to know the views of each participant in advance. And so she will, she will talk to each of us in advance. She has a very good feeling for my views, where we agree, where we disagree. And her job is to try to find the consensus of that group, also layer on her own views. But she also, so a lot of people say to me, well, you just do whatever Janet Yellen wants, right? No, it doesn't work that way. Uh, this is, power is distributed among this group, and so a big part of the Fed chair job is to find the consensus, not only on the action, but on the statement, as well as on the balance sheet, and then see if she, in that meeting, can forge a consensus, not necessarily unanimous consensus, but we've, she's looking to try to find the consensus for action, uh, and that's a big part of, uh, of the process. So what do you see as the main challenges facing the Fed going forward? <coughs> For me, the secular headwinds, the structural headwinds I talked about, to me, are the main thing I think explicitly or implicitly we're wrestling over. And here's what I mean. Um, we had a meeting this morning with students, as you mentioned, and one person said to me, a paraphrase, when are we going to get back to 5% Fed funds rate? And uh, here's the issue. Uh, when I was growing up in the business in the 80s and 90s, 4 or 5% would probably be about normal, neutral Fed funds rate. It's not the neutral, I, in my judgment, it's not the neutral Fed funds rate today. But so what happened? Mm -hmm. The world's changed dramatically. Part of the challenge of the Fed is, number one, to come to grips with the fact that this is a different world than the one I grew up in. And we have to adapt to that reality as opposed to harken back to the good old days and say it was like that and we're gonna get there whether if it kills us. We have to adapt to it. And then the second thing is to communicate it. So to understand it, develop good policy based on that, even though it might be very unpopular because mm -hmm. it's not what people were used to, but then do a better job in sessions like this and lots of other things, communicating why, if the Fed funds rate is only 75 to 100 basis points and we're in the seventh or eighth year of a recovery, how could that be? Either it could be either the Fed has made a mistake, or this is a very different world. Or better yet, we've had low, very low interest rates, Fed funds rate, for seven or eight years. Historically, if rates were this low for that long, you would have seen a dramatically overheated economy, right? Mm -hmm. We're not seeing that. Why not? That's what, to me, the big part of this job is, which makes it very challenging and I think makes it very important. We've got to come to grips with the new reality, face it, try to understand it, formulate policy that appropriately addresses it, and then communicate it. That, to me, is the big challenge today of the Fed. Um, and, uh, and, and you can never stop getting better at that challenge. So you, you talked about it's a, it's a new world. And so I'll say, when people get frustrated and say, my god, rates are so low, I can't make any of my savings, why, why can't it be the way it was? Well, it's going to have to be not the way it was, but the way that, based on the real, the real world as it is, 
where do we need to go? And that's, that's challenging to, to do that. Anyhow, sorry. Okay. So you, you talked about being, uh, that the U.S. economy is embedded in a, a different world, that yeah. things have changed. So to, to what extent does the Fed take into consideration developments in the global economy when making monetary <coughs> policy? So I would say it's possible 20, 30 years ago, this is true as a business person also, as a business person, I could be a very good business person 23 years ago, be knowledgeable what was going on outside the United States, but it wouldn't, I didn't have to be as knowledgeable. That started changing as com countries outside the United States grew more and China got dramatically bigger. Today, if you are going to be a central banker in the United States, you've got to understand the world. Why? Because financial markets are much more globally interconnected and economies are much more interconnected. And so what goes on in Europe with Brexit or Latin America or China can easily spill over into the United States, either in economic conditions or financial conditions. And so part of my job is to make sure that, we, that I understand and have a view on what's going on around the world. And when appropriate, that means getting on a plane and going there. Because I learned from living in Asia for five years, for example, you can't understand China unless you go there regularly, which is why we, we will make sure to go there on some regular basis. Okay. So <coughs> you mentioned Brexit. Has it had an impact on any of the indicators we looked at or on the U.S. economy, and, or should we expect it to? So the punchline, Brexit for the United States so far has been manageable. It's certainly, I think it will have some negative effect on U.K. growth, although not as bad as people expected. But one of the reasons it hasn't been as bad is, is the currency in the U.K. is dramatically weakened, which is, tends to be stimulative. You know, it's easier to sell your exports when, when you have your weaker currency. Um, we're watching, and I'm watching very carefully, what happens next in France, what happens the election in Germany. Is there a contagion, i.e., does this move toward uh, more independence uh, spread? Uh, if it does not, I think Brexit will turn out to be ultimately relatively manageable for the United States and even for Europe, but we're watching and monitoring very carefully to see if there's further actions that could happen in other parts of the continent. And, and why, why does this matter to me? Um, I mentioned aging demographics in the United States. Um, what's the answer? What are one of the solutions for the world? All advanced economies are aging, not just happening here. Growth is slowing. Um, so then the question is, so what do we do about it? I think the challenge for the world is, which we're struggling with, um, immigration, immigrants and their children have been over 50% of the workforce growth in the United States over the last 20 years. It's our view at the Dallas Fed that immigrants and their children will be more than 50% of the workforce growth in the next 20 years. It's so another way of saying engagement with the world, uh, trade, integrated supply chains, logistics, I'm confident, have improved competitiveness in the United States. And we have added jobs as a result of it that we would have otherwise lost to Asia. Mm -hmm. What's the advanced world going to do? Are we going to turn more inward because of the dislocations created by globalization and some of the threats? Or are we going to find a way to manage it, because I think the latter, finding a way to management is, I think, over the long run, more likely to lead to higher rates of growth. And that's why Brexit and this trend matters, and I'm watching it very carefully. Okay. So what's your answer to those who question the constitutionality of the Federal Reserve System? The actual constitutionality of it? Yeah. Okay. Well, we came after the Constitution. Um, so on a serious note, I'll put, I'll put it th th this way. Um, I think another way to say that is, is it wise to have an independent central bank? Mm -hmm. You know, boy, you weren't elected, you have a lot of power, and this is one of the, we have a four and a half trillion dollar balance sheet, and that has created a lot of sensitivity. The balance sheet pre-crisis was about 800 billion. And the, why is the balance sheet so much bigger? We spent the last number of years doing quantitative easing, several rounds. Some people would say we went too far, we did too much. Okay. And you now have a lot of power, regulatory power. You've got a big balance sheet. <clears throat> and because we haven't had much fiscal policy in the last seven or eight years, because of, because of high degrees of debt, most of the economic policy in the United States has been from the Fed. Mm -hmm. And so 
I think we were well served at the Fed to be very sensitive to those concerns. Having said that, I think it's central, critical to the United States that we have an independent central bank. A lot of the things that we need to do are going to be unpopular, but I think you need a central bank that does the analysis without regard to political, mat to political factors or political influence, does the analysis, debates it out, calls it the way you see him, faces reality, and has got the ability to make decisions, sometimes tough decisions, that are in the best interest of the country. I think the United States has been enormously well served. And I can say this as an outsider to the Fed, new, I think you, our country has been enormously well served over the last several decades having an independent central bank. And so I think it's critical to the country and our future that we have that independence. So you mentioned that you're a bit of an outsider. You've been in the Federal Reserve System since 2015. Yeah, a year and a half. Uh, so, so you, you've held, that get, means that you've held leadership roles in the private sector, <coughs> okay, the education sector as a dean, uh, and now in the quasi-governmental sector. <coughs> What's different about leadership and management in those different contexts? So as you know, well know because you've been through also, um, the success factors and the cultures are different in business, in academia, and then again at the Fed. And I've learned in my old age as a leader that you have to adapt your leadership style to analyze um, what are the key success factors and how the culture is different. So what's an example? In the business world, and we've got a lot of business people in this audience, if I see something I don't like or I don't like how the business is going, if I have enough time, money, and determination, I can pretty much change uh, all the key design factors of the business. I can change the people, I can change the markets we serve, I can change the culture, I can change the leadership, I can change the incentives, I can change all that. Maybe wrong, but I can do it, okay? So that's one type of management style in a business. And obviously by industry, the cultures are very different. When I go to academia, the most significant thing I learned about academia is tenure. <laughs> okay, what does that mean? It means your best people who've been the most successful, once they get tenure, they're set. You, you want to threaten them, you want to you 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 do things to try to motivate them. You have mm -hmm. to learn in business, you can fire people, you can hire people, you can promote people, you can pay them more money, less money. You don't have those levers in academia. And so what I learned is more persuasion, more sharing information, as a leader, go slower, more buy-in. Uh, by the way, I found in business, those are all good things too, but in academia, they're, they're widely sometimes, people come in and think, you can be directive, not gonna work in academia. You have to get, it's not, often doesn't work in business, but in mm -hmm. academia, you've got to share more information and power is widely distributed. The chief executive job is a much weaker position in academia than it is in business. Okay, then get to the Fed. Fed is a whole different organization, as you know. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of academics, and most of the leadership are PhD academics. So they come from that background I just described. Having said that, the Fed is a much more hierarchical organization. Um, it's got a very strong culture. Um, the nature of what we're doing is very different. And so what I've learned is I have to adapt to that which means the management style that worked in academia won't work at the Fed. The, 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 the leadership style for sure that worked in business won't work at the Fed. And so, as the people of the Dallas Fed will tell you, I am learning. And so there are times where I say, my Lord, why do we do this? Or gee, we should change this. And I realize there's a, pro my, what I've learned, if you see something weird at the Fed, or you can't understand why we do it, ask more questions, because there's probably a good reason. There are some things we do at the Fed, I think, that we all come together and agree. Maybe that should be changed. But what I've learned, the long, it's a long-winded way of saying, if you're a leader, you've got to adapt to the culture, adapt to what the critical success factors are. And the most important thing I learned in this job is you've got to show respect and by digging in and learning, 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 and realizing what you don't know. Leadership is about asking questions. You don't need to act like a know-it-all. You're not going to know. 
And I think what's helped me in each of these moves is being willing to roll up my sleeves, get in there and learn and ask questions and always be a student and never get too big for your britches where you don't need to keep learning. And I think that's helped uh, in being at the Fed. Well, I'd love to keep asking questions and learn a bit more, but I've been given the hook. Okay. So I think we're done. Would everyone please join me in thanking our speaker? desperately afraid that you would forget us. So we, we've given you this lovely plaque, Thank you. suitable for hanging. Thank you. So if everyone would please applaud again. Thank you all for coming. Have a good evening.